Welcome to Work Life by Design. I'm your host, Mel Marsden. If the last few years have taught us anything, it's that change is inevitable and we no longer need to go to work to work. As a workplace dynamic strategist and the founder of Community, I draw back the curtains on my own business, the clients and projects that we deliver, along with tapping into the knowledge and insights from academics, business leaders and champions of change. I believe that our environments have the power to positively influence our behaviour and performance, inspiring our human potential. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Work Life by Design podcast. Now, I have some pretty exciting news to share with you and that is that my book, The Next Workplace, Designing Dynamic Environments That Inspire Human Potential is available for pre-order and we are going to be taking the book on the road to start a conversation in each of these capital cities across Brisbane, Melbourne and Sydney. So if you are in any of those locations and you would love to come and join this conversation about how we can make work better, how we can elevate our experience for work and the impact that our workplaces are having on our people, then I would love you to come and join us. You can head over to my website at melissamarsden.com.au forward slash book and you'll be able to pre-order the book there or you can find the event in your local city. So I'd love to see you there. Now to get into today's episode, I want you to take a moment and I want you to think about this. Let me know if any of these resonate for you. Are you feeling overwhelmed, under the pump, stressed, completely time poor, and like there aren't enough hours in the day, which is leaving you totally exhausted and easily distracted? Sounding familiar? Well, you are not alone. According to Dr. Christy Goodwin, my guest today, this is very common, and she's labelled it ousted. And she's here to tell us that thanks to our technology that has pervaded every corner of our lives, we are now living and working in ways that are completely incongruent with our neurobiology. Dr. Christie has made multiple appearances here on the podcast and with the release of her latest book, Dear Digital, We Need to Talk, I had to have her back to share with us the impact that our always on digital world is having on us both personally and professionally. Dr. Christie is an award-winning researcher and speaker who is on a mission to promote employee well-being and bolster workplace productivity. As one of Australia's digital well-being and productivity experts, she shares practical brain-based hacks to tame our tech habits and the latest evidence-based strategies to decode the neurobiology of peak performance in the technological era. Now, Dr. Christie works with senior business leaders and HR executives across the country's top organizations to support them in promoting employee digital well-being and performance. So in today's conversation, she's going to share with us the research and the statistics on how our digital devices are impacting everything from our cortisol and our stress levels to our sleep and even how we breathe. But don't worry, she's not just going to dump all this on us, tell us how bad it all is, or recommend that we take a digital detox. She's also going to share with us some simple, easy to adopt ways that we can tame our tech using her micro habits and implement digital guardrails. So whether you are looking for easy ways to steal back your focus so that you're not being constantly bombarded by the dings and pings of all of our digital devices, or you're a people and culture leader who's looking at how your organization can foster some digital boundaries as we're starting to navigate this whole new uncharted flexible working territory, Dr. Christie will share her ideas on how to make this a reality. So today I have the lovely Dr. Christy Goodwin coming back to join me for a third time on the podcast. So welcome, Christy, and thanks for coming today. Hi, Mel. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's so great to have you back again, Christy. Now, you have just written and released another book. Now, having written my first book, why did you go back and decide to write a second book? What inspired you? It was a whole lot of serendipitous events. If I'm really honest, it was an awful personal experience. I had several years ago, I'd been overseas to deliver a keynote and I arrived back in Sydney airport and did what most people did at the baggage carousel. And I pulled out my phone and I saw that awful red icon declaring that I had all these unread emails. I thought I'll triage those in the taxi ride home. And of course I fell asleep in the taxi. 
So I got home and um, I only had two children at the time. I've since had a third. But during the time, and I'd been away for just two nights, and during that time, my middle son, Billy, had missed me. So I had very ambitiously um, scheduled a video meeting during his anticipated nap time upon my return. But Billy needed some extra mummy cuddles. And so I opened the lid on my laptop just to send one email to cancel the work call that I'd ambitiously, foolishly scheduled. And I went down the digital vortex. I don't know if it's ever happened to you, Mel, but we can so easily get sucked into the vortex. I went in my inbox just to send one, but there was that awful red icon declaring that my inbox had increased to, I think, 144 emails since the baggage carousel. I became digitally distracted and I was so distracted that I wasn't watching Billy as he climbed on the lounge adjacent to me and he fell face first off the lounge, smashed his face and required urgent hospitalisation. Now, to ease my mother's guilt, I will admit he'd done the exact same thing two weeks prior when my husband was dutifully supervising him, but this was a real catalyst for me. For so long, a lot of my research in the the earlier years was around kids and teens and around their digital obsession or infatuation. But this was a moment in time where I realized even as somebody who speaks, researches, studies and writes about digital distraction and digital well-being, I'm not immune to the digital pool. And this was honestly a life-changing moment where I realized the, the deadly, dire consequences that can result when we're digitally distracted. So that set me on a quest to understand, you know, as adults, we wag the finger and said, our kids are addicted, they can't put it down. But the harsh truth is, I think as adults, we're struggling to manage our digital infatuation and our digital devices. So it really um, spurred me to go on and look at what is it about the online world? What draws us into that vortex? What makes us so distracted? Why is it impacting us as adults? And that's why I decided I needed to share what I'd learnt and put it in a book and provide people with strategies. There's so much advice about do a digital detox or cancel your Netflix subscription. It's outdated and redundant advice. So I wanted to give people really practical ways to use technology. Oh, look, and I completely agree with you in terms of that getting distracted. Like it's so easy to do. Like you get that notification pops up on your phone. You go, I'll just check that one. And then all of a sudden you're over here, you're on Instagram, you're there. And then, you know, all of a sudden you look up and you go, oh, five minutes has passed. Whoops. Or, you know, there's that pull that does come with it. And the tech has been engineered. I often say technology has been designed to rob us as humans of our two most important resources, our time and our attention. You know, the fact that your notification bubble comes to you. We have ancient paleolithic brains. We have brains that are biologically designed to go and get information. We are designed to go and forage and hunt and seek. But today in the digital world, information is constantly being thrust at us. Alerts, notifications, reminders, pings and dings. And our brain isn't designed to deal with that because our brain cannot differentiate between a team's notification and a tiger chasing us. Our brain perceives both of them as a potential stressor. The fact, you know, our notification bubble is usually red. Red is associated with danger, urgency, importance. The fact that your notification bubble screams with a metric telling you how many unread emails or how many unread DMs or chats you've got draws us in. So the tech's actually working against us, but we are also allowing it to do that as well. Yeah, and it's really interesting. I you know, shared my screen the other day and someone saw the number of unread emails that are in my inbox and it's it's in the 30,000s. Let's just be honest. <laughs> they had a heart attack. But I know that's one of the things that you talk about too is that, you know, there are these outdated ideals of getting to inbox zero and doing digital detoxes and, you know, completely disconnecting. We know that that's not possible because we rely on technology to do our jobs, to stay connected. You know, in this most disconnected world, this is how we do actually stay connected. So what are some of the ways that you are recommending to individuals and people on how they can actually just be smarter or wiser about the way that they're interacting with their digital devices? I totally agree. You know, a digital detox is not the solution. In fact, the research actually tells us they don't work. So I think it's important to know that. They create a binge and purge cycle. So we go offline for a couple of days, but we come back and we're inundated with even more messages to catch up on. Um, This is why we know many people are resisting going on holidays 
or why a Slack study um, was shared at the end of um, 2022 that showed that most Australians who were planning on taking their annual leave last year were also planning on keeping up with their emails because the thought of returning to work after your holiday period to a bulging inbox causes people even more stress. So we have to come up. I think we, we as individuals, we have to establish our digital borders and boundaries because technology has permeated all parts of our lives professionally and personally. And I think, you know, the pandemic certainly obliterated the boundaries that may have once existed. Like with organisations, I talk to them about their digital guardrails. At an individual level, we have to come up with some parameters. You know, where are your no-go tech zones in your house? Um, when are you going to switch off? Are you going to have an out-of-office message on if you're doing a four-day week and you're not going to be responding on that day that you're having off? Is it um, having something in your email signature to communicate what I call your tech expectations? Is it, you know, explaining how responsive you'll be, clearly articulating how to contact you if it is an urgent or critical matter? You know, really simple things for me, it's been managing my notifications, disabling non-essential notifications. I now bundle or batch my notifications so you can choose what time of the day you want your team's chat notifications to come through rather than them dribbling in throughout the day. If you're a parent and you're bombarded with school notifications or WhatsApp messages, you can specify what time you want them to come in. And the third part of my notifications is creating a VIP list. So when I put my phone or my computer on focus mode or do not disturb mode, everybody gets blocked apart from those critical people on my VIP list. So this gives people the peace of mind that I can get some focused work done or maybe I can spend some quality time with my family without the, you know, that nagging thought that sits in the back of your head, you know, what if something's urgent? What if I'm missing something? It gives us almost that mental respite and mental peace of mind. I can have this focused, uninterrupted time and anything that is of a critical, urgent matter or nature will get through. So if you've got ageing parents, if you've got young children in childcare or school, they might be the people on your VIP list. If you've got a team member and you're working on a time-sensitive critical project and they might need some feedback or some sort of connection with you, they'll get through, but everybody else gets blocked. So there's certainly things that we can do to take back control of technology. We've just got to know how to do some of those, I call them micro habits. And I think there's some great tips that you've just shared there because I think a lot of us don't know how to put these boundaries in place using technology. I mean, those boundaries are, are happening for us if we know actually how to set our phones up and how to set our email up and, you know, our Teams notifications. Because I know that for me, there's always this naggling, niggling thought in my mind going, if I send that Teams message now, just because I'm working late at night doesn't mean that I want my team to respond or, you know, how can I get that message to this person without it being disruptive or expecting a response? I really like that idea of setting those digital guardrails. How do you go about setting those with organisations so that, everybody is on the same page because it, it's all great for one individual to set these boundaries. But if they're not aligned to the team or they're not aligned to the business objectives, that can cause some friction, which causes other headaches. Absolutely. So in 2022, I had the privilege of working with a number of organizations, small, right up to really large scale um, multinational organizations to help them co-create their digital guardrails. So these are the, some people call them team charters, other organizations call them a team agreement. But these are clearly explicating the digital norms, digital practices and principles that underpin how organisations or perhaps teams will use technology. And the process involves doing a digital audit. So we do this in a myriad of ways, looking at a lot of organisations now have Microsoft Viva Insights data. So we can get some intel on when emails are being sent, the frequency of meetings, even as granular as the number of people who are multitasking during your team's meetings. We can look at the frequency of team chats after hours team's chats. Then I run some focus groups and the focus groups are powerful at really getting that qualitative data in terms of what's working really well within an organisation in terms of their digital usage. You know, are the virtual meetings a great alternative? Are hybrid meetings working effectively or are there some things that aren't working well? Do we use after hours emails or what's a better protocol around that? The cameras need to be on or off for your virtual meetings. What's a company-wide default setting in terms of the duration of your virtual meeting? Because Zoom fatigue is a real phenomenon. Stanford University have done so much research in this space. 
So really coming and getting almost like a pulse check in the organisation and what's working well and what needs to be tweaked. Then I go off with some key team members and we co-create these digital guardrails. And then they're fed back to focus groups and then to team members for feedback and revision. And then we come up uh, usually with some guiding principles or a couple of key pillars. And this gives people the peace of mind knowing that I can switch off from work. Microsoft data tells us now that 28% of knowledge workers are working between 10 p.m. and midnight. It's called the triple productivity peak. And people can look at this two ways. People can say, well, that's a marker of more flexible work arrangements. You know, people may have played golf after work instead of working a longer day. They may have picked up children or cared for aging parents, and then they're doing a later shift. But the other angle to which we look at this, and I think this is a more telling perspective, is that this is a red flag for burnout. Always on, working increasing amounts of time. We've seen a 13%, and I think this is a very conservative estimate, but a 13% increase in the average workday since the start of the pandemic. So if we're now working remotely, we've absorbed the commute time with extra work. So these guardrails, and because they're co-established, teams have buy-in. Now, it's not, I'm really clear that it's not a policy, but these are some parameters around how we'll use technology. So people feel like they've got the opportunity to psychologically detach from their work. People, part of the guardrails is coming up with what I call a communication escalation plan. So if there is an urgent, time-critical, you know, really important matter that has to be communicated, there is one mode through which that is communicated. And I usually recommend a good old fashioned phone call because people say, you know, I've got to check, keep on top of emails. And it's really hard. You know, you might have your own personal boundaries, but if your boss is emailing you at 11 o'clock on a Wednesday night and all your colleagues are responding, it's hard as a human not to buy into that. Um, and it really has a contagion effect. So that's how we do guardrails. And it's working brilliantly at really putting those parameters in place in, in an organization. I'm interrupting this episode with a very special announcement. I'm so excited to tell you that my book, The Next Workplace, Designing Dynamic Environments That Inspire Human Potential, is now available for pre-order. This book has been in the making for a few years now and brings together all of my knowledge, research and insights on what it takes to design a dynamic workplace. As organisations are navigating a new frontier, struggling to figure out what's next in today's hybrid and distributed world, how can we leverage one of our greatest assets, our work? place. The next workplace will show you how to leverage your workplace to attract and retain talent, increase employee engagement and elevate employee experience, plus deliver bottom line returns on your investment. And to celebrate its release, I'm inviting you to join me for an evening of storytelling as I engage industry leaders in a conversation on the design of work and place, exploring the opportunities for our environment to inspire our human potential. These conversations are going to be happening in Brisbane on March the 22nd, in Melbourne on March 29th, and in Sydney on April 5th. And I would love for you to come and join me. So to grab your copy of the book and reserve your seat at the book launch, head over to my website, melissamarsden.com.au forward slash book. These are really new challenges that organizations are having to navigate and to work out. I mean, pre and post pandemic is kind of like the terms that we use these days, but pre pandemic, these things weren't something that we had to consider or we didn't consider them as much because we weren't using and so heavily reliant on technology. But this is now everyday methods of communication, methods of working where, as you said, Zoom fatigue is a real thing. And, you know, there's some great data around that, which I know you and I have shared before in terms of brain studies and stress load and even just having that, you know, micro breaks between one Zoom call and another to be able to readjust that stress level in your brain. These are real challenges that I think organizations need to be paying much greater attention to. And setting up these digital guardrails are going to be so helpful because when we're working with organizations at the moment, a lot of it is around that flexibility, the ability for them to work remotely and to be adaptable and mobile and have flexibility. But to what end is kind of the next question. How do we ensure that people are getting the right support? We're working within 
timeframes that enable us, you know, some of us have to do synchronous work. It's not always asynchronous, which enables that ability to be completely flexible. How are you seeing some of those challenges navigate and how are they playing out when they're actually working through these digital guardrails? Anything that's sort of popping up more than once or a a common challenge that you're seeing in organisations? Yes, and it is that delicate balance between employee flexibility and organisational objectives. So I often say we need to have flexibility within a framework. So this is having, you know, tight parameters, clear expectations or tech expectations in the digital space, um, but really being explicit. I think we were trying, you know, in 2021, maybe a probably more 2022, finding our feet of what's hybrid work? Is it here to stay? I think hybrid work's now given. It's not an optional nice to have. It's an integral part of your EVP. So we have to start looking at what does this look like at a mechanistic um, level and how can we make hybrid work work? So I think coming up with those parameters is really key. That communication escalation plan is also critical What I'm seeing at the moment is a lot of organisations saying, we've got our head around hybrid work, but the problem is now people are coming back to the office only to sit in a myriad of virtual meetings all day. And if their offices aren't acoustically treated the right way, if there hasn't been some thought to the physical design of the office and meeting rooms and spaces, people are going back into the office only to hear their co-workers on video calls. And as you know, I know you work closely with um, Professor Libby Sander, the research is really clear. Hearing background noise increases our cortisol levels, our stress response. Hearing background noise is said to, especially intelligible speech, impact our cognitive performance by around 10%. So we've got to start redesigning the physical design of our workspaces, making accommodations where possible, but also thinking about, well, I know you talk about this at length, Mel, like what's the function of the office? How are we going to redesign our workdays and making better choices with those two factors? Exactly right. That research that Libby's done there around audible speech and the impact of that, you know, this is why open plan offices have had such a bad rap for so long is because we weren't provisioning for people to be able to do that deep concentrated work or to be able to take those those calls or those Teams meetings or, you know, back then it was Skype calls in individual spaces to enable we're not distracting and impacting on everyone else around us. So again, yes, like you said, the purpose of the office needs to be really clearly articulated by organisations because if we are expecting people just to come in so that they are present and sit in Teams calls all day, then there is no value in that. So we really need to be revisiting that whole construct of why we have an office, what's its value, why we're using it. And everything that you're doing here is helping feed into that because there's no point us creating all of these spaces if we then don't have those frameworks that you referenced to support people's individual ability to choose how and when they work and what's going to be that best environment for them and how they connect and, you know, really engage with their colleagues. At the moment, another thing that I'm hearing from a number of organisations is that some organisations very generously provided noise cancelling, earmuff style headphones and microphones. The problem now is that people are spending in their these open plan offices that haven't had the acoustic treating that they need or, or meeting rooms designed is that people now, because they can't hear themselves with these noise-cancelling headphones on, their volume is even louder than what they'd normally be. Um, You know, people often say to me, you know, years gone by, Christy, we still had open plan offices and people got on a phone call or would have a phone meeting and never bothered me. So why is a video call so much more taxing and distracting? And I think one of the reasons are those headphones. Another reason is that most phone calls were much shorter. You know, you had a quick call with someone. It wasn't a 30, 40, 50 minute meeting that kept going on and on. So all of these things I think are happening. And again, we're designing on the fly. We're making adjustments and accommodations and there's no playbook. I know your book soon will hopefully provide some strong parameters in this space, but there's no test case of saying, this is how you structure a a modern workplace. And that's where I think leading organisations, you know, I know you work closely with Jess from Entang Group, who are really forward thinking at how can we structure our work days? How can we make accommodations and adjustments? And we need people and we need organisations generously sharing what's working and also sharing what doesn't work. I think there's a lot of shame still about, you know, sharing this particular initiative didn't work, this works really well. 
and collectively learning from that. It's a real experiment at the moment and I think that's difficult for organisations because it's unknown, they don't want to be investing the money behind these things if they're not going to succeed. Some organisations are a lot more risk adverse and not willing to sort of take that step outside the boundary but like you mentioned, Jess and the team there on Antain Australia, they've introduced the nine-day fortnight. So Jess implemented this just over 12 months ago so that they took their teams down to nine-day fortnights they have every second Monday off, which is they call Entain Day, and it's about active rest or any kind of rest day. You can choose it to study. Like they've put parameters in place and, you know, sit on the couch and watch Netflix all day, go for it. But they actively encourage their team to then share that. But the way that they have enabled that to happen without losing any productivity from their team is they also introduce Meeting Free Wednesday. So they had to kind of start to cut down on the internal meetings to enable that to happen. Now, 12 months on, they have evaluated this and they've determined to keep it. So Entain Day is here to stay because they've seen the results and they've seen the productivity uplift that's come as a result of implementing these sorts of structures. What are you seeing in other organisations? Yes, so a really fascinating study was published last in 2022 by MIT Sloan and I think it combined Harvard Business Review. And this study involved a number of organisations, so it was quite a large-scale study. And they actually quantified the costs or the benefits of having designated meeting-free days. And now, whilst this may sound completely unrealistic and ambitious, this particular study quantified and found that if you nominated two internal meeting-free days a week, the increase in productivity, I think it was around 72%, and there was in the 40, 42, 47% reduction in stress. Now, Two days may not be tenable for your organisation, but I think it illustrates just how powerful having designated meeting-free times, even if it's not a whole day, even if it's not obviously with your external stakeholders, but having that peace of mind that your calendar is not going to be clogged or look like a Tetris game with back-to-back meetings, having time for that deep focused work is, I think, more important than ever. So that's what we're certainly seeing in that space. I'm also seeing, and it's great to see, and I'm hoping we get some Australian data soon. I know Unilever are certainly on board and some other smaller organisations, but the initial four-day work week that was trialled in Europe last year, the preliminary data coming out of that, again, with a large number of organisations and employees of various sizes, was compelling for both employees and employers in terms of productivity gains, in terms of well-being and most importantly for organisations, the impact on bottom line. So we're seeing some really positive trends and it's great that we're getting data. Organisations love data and I think it's really important that we're making informed and educated decisions in this space. And I think that's really important is because we can't make those decisions and we can't back them and we can't continue to extend them if we're not having that data there to measure it we need to be able to see that they're successful and back to your point around the meeting free days I can vouch for that like the amount of work that I can smash through on a day that I don't have meetings is incredible because you're not bound by these time constraints and this is one of the things that I find really frustrating about a day that's dotted with meetings is that you can't really get into any sort of deep focus work because you know in the back of your mind, I've got that meeting coming up in half an hour. I'm only going to be able to do this task. So there's no point going and getting into something that's really meaty because you just don't have the capability to really invest the time that it's needed to get into that flow state, to get deep into it and actually produce anything really productive. So I think organisations that are starting to look to those meeting free days is going to be um, a big driver for that productivity, which is going to enable people to consider more flexible work solutions. And whether it's the four day work week or not, because I've heard arguments to and from that, because some are saying, well, it's not actually the four day work week that's the problem. It's the actual workload that we're expecting people to do. That is, you know, the thing that we need to reevaluate. So it's, it's just incredible. Some of the stuff that's coming out at the moment. Now, in terms of your book and the principles that are in it, you've shared some incredible research to date and some other little tips and tricks, but give me a bit of a snapshot of what the premise of the book's about and what what readers can expect if they dive in. So I think that we've developed some digital habits and behaviours over the years. It's certainly not just attributed to the pandemic, but some digital habits and behaviours that are completely incongruent with how we are designed. I call it our HOS, our human operating system. 
And as humans, we have some biological constraints. We can't outperform our neurobiology, the way our brains and bodies are designed. And I think our tech habits are having a really negative impact on our brains and bodies. In the book, I use the acronym OUSTED. I think our tech habits are making us feel overwhelmed, like we're constantly under the pump. We're stressed, time poor, exhausted and distracted. And the way we're using our devices, both professionally and personally, is to blame. And I think what's happening is the collision of two things. The first thing in that our tech habits have done is they've introduced a whole lot of micro stresses into our days. Now, I want to point out as humans, we are biologically designed to cope with stress. We are designed, however, to cope with a really short burst of stress and we are designed to resolve the stress cycle. So there was a potential stressor, a mammoth was chasing us, we'd run off into the distance, short burst of stress and we'd resolve the cycle. But in today's constantly digitally demanding world where alerts and notifications have become the soundtrack of our day, no longer do we have short bursts of stress and very rarely do we ever close the stress cycle. So these micro stresses seem benign and on their own, they probably are. But what happens is these micro stresses are accumulating and a stressed brain is easily distracted. A stressed brain cannot work in an optimal state. So things like alerts, notifications, video calls, as you mentioned before, are really, really stressful. We know multitasking and Microsoft data is telling us we can't hide from the fact that most people are spending a lot of their virtual meetings triaging their Teams chats or their inboxes. All of these things stress our brains. The second thing that's happening at the same time, so we've got this increase in our micro stresses, and at the same time, our tech habits have completely eroded, annihilated, I might say, the biological buffers that used to naturally be baked into our days as humans that helped us to manage these stresses. We used to move a whole lot more than what we do. Our tech habits are making us far more sedentary. We used to get more sunlight. Um, we know that adults and children need at least 90 minutes of sunlight interspersed throughout their day. Critical for our sleep, resets our circadian rhythm, and we know helps beat myopia, which is nearsightedness. But many of us are inside on our devices. We are not getting enough sleep. Our tech habits are having a huge impact on our sleep. Believe it or not, our tech habits are shaping how we breathe. There is, I may have mentioned it before, a condition called email apnea, where we go into our inboxes, we hold our breath, we dump a whole lot of cortisol, our heart rate accelerates, our pupils dilate, we're having a physiological stress response. When we're on our screens or a tablet or a smartphone, we have a very narrow gaze. Now, biologically, we narrow our gaze when we're stressed. We have to hone in on what the potential danger is that's threatening us. As humans, we're biologically designed to look in the distance, to dilate our gaze. So again, all of these things are colliding. We've, we're being bombarded, peppered with constant digital stimulation. So the micro stresses have increased, but at the same time, we've removed those buffers that used to help us cope with our stress response. And so this is why we're left feeling ousted. Oh, it made me tired just listening to all of that. And I'm just going tick, tick, tick. I can and see how all of those things and you know just even reflecting on my own day and definitely holding my breath during emails but it is that load and you just even shared some really interesting little tips that you know getting outside and getting that 90 minutes of sunlight making sure that we've got that incidental exercise happening you've actually just proved another case for me too in terms of open plan because at least in open plan we can gaze out into the distance a little bit further than being stuck in an office whereas right now I'm sitting in my office here at home and my screen is right here and then the wall is behind it. So we do have that very short-sightedness when we are working in those confined spaces. So there's some incredible research that you've got there and it all goes into that book. And what I'm really excited about is getting into it and actually starting to apply some of these techniques that you have shared in there and these micro habits to start to manage my notifications, manage my tech, but also not mine, my children and my husband as well, because we're all being impacted by this. We are, and it's not going away. And I share this because it's such a powerful story and it has really stuck with me. Just as I was finishing editing the book, I was going to meet a friend for coffee. She was dragging me off my laptop. She said, Christy, you need to practice what you preach. You need to have a break. And I was waiting for my friend to turn up at the coffee shop. And of course she was late and I was agitated because the coffee is a valuable 10 minutes I could have been working. And of course I met a lady and we had struck up a conversation. Now this lady didn't know what I did. 
And I said to her, what do you do for work? And she explained to me that she was a palliative care nurse, had been for 30 years. And I said, have you read, and I don't know if you've read it, Mel, Bronnie wears the top five regrets of the dying. I said to her, the top five of the regrets of the dying, true, powerful book. And she said, yes, they are. But she leaned in and, again, I hadn't told her what I was doing, what my book was about, and she said, but there's a sixth regret creeping in. And she said, tragically, people who are facing the end of their life in their 40s and 50s are now saying in the final stages of their life, I wish I'd spent less time on my phone. I wish I'd spent less time plugged into my devices. And so this is not, again, not saying that, well, the solution is to go off on a digital detox or do a digital reboot or a retreat. And that's not the solution because whether we love it or loathe it, we're living in a digital world. So it's all about how can we use technology? It's not an anti-tech or a, you know, a negative approach to tech. It's all about, yes, how can we use it? But how can we do so in ways that are congruent with how we are designed as humans? We cannot outperform our biological blueprint. And so it's all about little micro habits. And again, it's not about overhaul or doing a complete digital reset. The book's just a compilation, what I call a menu of micro habits. And the idea is that people can cherry pick the micro habits that will work for them, their role, their context, and habit stack over time. I think it's going to be brilliant. I think there's going to be some really great value that comes out of this for individuals, but also for organizations. So if there is a business that wants to dive in and look at how to set up these digital guardrails with you, because I think they're just going to be invaluable and absolutely necessary for organizations as we move forward, how can people get in touch with you and where can they grab your book? Well, ironically, online for both. (laughs) Irony isn't lost on me. So send me an email. I won't be always immediately responsive. We've created some autoresponders that might trick you into thinking that I'm writing an email back straight away. But please reach out. Um, I'd welcome the opportunity to have a conversation. The book is available in traditional bookstores and it's available online through obviously digital bookstores. But the idea is that it's really simple things, um, science-backed, but simple. Someone introduced me the other day and they made a Bopar, but it actually turned out quite well. They said, Christy's a pracademic. And I thought they meant practically an academic, like I almost made it. And they said, no, 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 she is practical and an academic. And the word has stuck because I'm the first to say, and I say this in a loving way, and I know you'll have some academics listening to this and I may offend them, but academics need to communicate, need to disseminate their work to the people that matter. And I think we have to use research and science, but translate it into really practical and digestible things that we can all implement. So. That was the goal of the book. Absolutely. And I know that that is something that you do really well, Christy. You make academic speak accessible for us to actually understand because I have read some of those academic studies and I have to read them about three or four times over to actually understand what it is that I'm reading. But you make it so easy to get to the point and know exactly what I need to take away from this and then to be able to adopt it. So I think, yeah, if organizations are looking to get those digital guardrails in place, which I know so many of my clients are working in that space at the moment to try and really figure this out, grab yourself a copy of the book, get in touch with Christy. It has been fabulous having you back with us again on the podcast, Christy. Um, It was actually episode 17 that you joined me originally, and we were talking about digital well-being back then. We are up in our early hundreds now. So thank you so much for coming back again and joining me. It's been fabulous talking with you and best of luck with the book. 